following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, please ensure that you are of legal drinking age and have fun but drink responsibly. A Kentucky woman, who was 25 years old at the time and had one hell of a maternal instinct, fought off a knife-wielding attacker who was attempting to steal her baby. That in and of itself is pretty wild, but the fact that she was nine months pregnant and a few days overdue at that makes this one heck of a story. We're going to delve into the pathology and the history of the criminal and a lot into the story of the victim. I think this story calls for a pretty strong drink, so let's have at it. For today's crime, we're headed to Kentucky, so I knew we had to travel down the bourbon trail. So for today's margarita, we're doing one part bourbon, and then one part tequila. To that, we'll add two parts triple sec. One more part orange juice to balance out the bourbon, and one part lime juice. You could add a little bit of honey if you wanted to add to the sweetness if you thought it needed more sweetness, but I think we're going to go with this. We'll pop the lid on, shake away. Lid comes off. Strain, strain, strain. <laughs> ah. Good to go. All right, let's get to the mayhem. A major source for this week's episode is a book written by the survivor, Sarah Brady, herself. It's called Saving Grace and can be found in a variety of places, including Amazon. I'll be sure to link it in the description box below. If this case piques your interest and you want to learn more, I highly recommend reading the book. It's quite the fascinating read and really a fast read too, uh, with a lot of interesting details and a lot into the backstories of both the criminal and the survivor. It's not often that you get to read a firsthand account from a survivor. Sarah Brady was born in Newport, Kentucky in 1979 to parents Connie and William Brady. She grew up, in her own words, dirt poor. Sometimes dinner was actually just one TV dinner shared between her entire family. And speaking of her entire family, it was pretty big. She had three older half-brothers on her dad's side, one older half-sister on her mom's side, and then it was Sarah, and then Sarah's mom and her dad had two more daughters. So a total of seven kids. Her father was an independent carpet layer, and the family moved often out of financial necessity. Sarah's mother instilled in her the importance of gaining an education and the fact that that would be her ticket to getting out of poverty. When Sarah got into the fourth grade, her teachers actually recommended that she go to a different school in order to take advanced classes. She was very excited about it, but her father refused to let her go. He was of the belief that women really belonged in the home and that advanced education wasn't for women. This was really the final straw when it came to Connie and William's marriage, but their marriage had been struggling for a long time due in large part to all that instability caused by all the moving that the family did. One night, her mother packed up all their personal belongings, took her four girls, and moved back into Sarah's grandmother's house. They all shared one bedroom for seven years. Sarah attended Holmes High School and thrived. She ran cross country, she was on the cheerleading squad, and she was an honor roll student. During her junior year, she met Scott Hanton, and they started what became quite the idyllic high school romance. Scott was 17 at the time, and he actually already had a son from a previous relationship. Sarah was voted homecoming queen in her senior year and graduated high school in 1997. She began to work at a local bank 
and started taking classes at a local college. Scott had actually received a baseball scholarship, and so he went off to another town to study and play baseball. At this point, they were still dating and saw each other about two to three times per month. Scott quit college after Christmas during his sophomore year because he wanted to be a more dedicated father to his son, and that meant living at home. At this point, both Sarah and Scott actually moved in with Scott's parents, and it was at this time that Sarah actually became pretty close to both of Scott's parents. Eventually, they moved together to Latonia, Kentucky, which is a suburb of Covington, Kentucky. The first suburb, actually. They had struggles in their relationship early on, as can be expected with new relationships. Um, and by the time 2002 rolled around, they were engaged, uh, but they never really set a wedding date. It seems like that level of commitment was difficult for both Sarah and Scott to take. Despite this, they did try to have a child together for several years, uh, but doctors told Sarah she probably wouldn't ever be able to conceive. Katie Smith was born in 1983, the second of five girls in Independence, Kentucky. Katie's parents both struggled from alcohol abuse, and even though Katie was a vibrant and talkative child, it seems that from very early on in her life, she started to do whatever it took to gain attention. This included lying. She started to lie about a lot of things related to her health. By the time she was in high school, she had already faked at least one pregnancy and claimed to have several medical conditions, including fibromyalgia and lupus. A high school classmate who worked in a toy store said that Katie would often come into the toy store claiming to be pregnant, but that she never came back into the store with a baby or a child. She often wore maternity clothes to school. She also faked medical conditions with her parents. And when doctors told her parents that she wasn't actually sick, they suggested psychiatric care, but Katie refused. It appeared that getting attention became Katie's obsession. When Katie turned 18 years old, she claimed to have a flashback where she realized that her own father had molested her between the ages of seven and 13 years old. Her father was actually convicted of the crime and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Katie also claimed that her sisters had been molested too, a claim which all of them denied. In June of 2004, Sarah discovers that she's pregnant. At the time, Scott's son was a spirited nine-year-old that they were co-parenting with Scott's ex. Though he really wanted a baby brother, he couldn't help but show his excitement for what they learned would be a baby sister. The pregnancy progressed without any problems, and Scott and Sarah actually planned to marry after the birth of the baby. Sarah registered online for a baby registry at Babies R Us. At the time, the baby registry on Baby R Us's website was very, very public. In fact, you could search by people in your area and find women who were pregnant, their addresses, and their due dates. Sounds to me like quite the opportunity for predators. Katie Smith, by this point, was 22 years old and single. She lived in nearby Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, and had announced to friends and family that she was pregnant with twins. Katie was concerned about this pregnancy because according to her, she had already lost another set of twins in infancy. She devoured novels about pregnant women and about women with children. She made a nursery stocked with diapers, formula, baby toys, and everything you would need for a baby. She showed off an ultrasound photo to friends and family. In February of 2005, Sarah was five days overdue and expected to give birth any day, according to her doctors. On February 8th at 4 p.m., she got a phone call at her house, which she almost ignored. She was running late to pick up Scott from work, and after that, they were headed to their son's basketball game. She almost just let it go to the answering machine, but she didn't. Instead, she picked up the phone. A woman's voice that she didn't recognize asked for Sarah. She thought it was either a telemarketer or a bill collector, so she said that Sarah wasn't home. The voice said, Oh, well, this is Sarah. I'll just try back. And the line hung up. Sarah looked at the caller ID, which read animal shelter, but the numbers were all zeros. Strange. Indeed, later that evening, the woman called back. 
she said her name was Sarah Brody and that several gifts from the Baby's RS registry had been delivered to her by mistake. An innocent mix-up for two women whose names were so close to one another. At one point, the woman asked if Sarah was still pregnant. An odd question in retrospect, but Sarah didn't question it at the time. An even more odd conversation because there was no Sarah Brody. Sarah Brody was Katie Smith, and Katie Smith wasn't pregnant at all. In fact, Katie Smith had never been pregnant. She was a lonely young woman who desperately wanted a child. She had formed a devastating plan to become a mother like she most desperately wanted. Okay, so to avoid confusion, from this point forward, we're going to call Sarah Brady, Sarah, because that's her real name, and we're going to call Sarah Brody, Katie, because that's her real name. But just know that Sarah Brady didn't know that that was Katie's real name when she went over to the house. Sarah, feeling Katie had gone above and beyond by calling her to correct the mix-up, refused to let Katie bring the gifts by to her house and insisted that she go to Katie's house to pick up the gifts. She lived about 15 minutes away from Sarah in a basement apartment. When Sarah arrived, she noted that Katie seemed hugely pregnant. Katie produced a box of a Winnie the Pooh baby bottle and several other items that Katie actually recognized from her baby registry. But there was no receipt, so there was no way of knowing for sure. Katie had a quick explanation for this. Her husband must have just misplaced it. She said she would look for it for Sarah so Sarah would know who the gifts were from. Later that same day, Sarah received another call from Katie who said an additional package had arrived from UPS this time. Katie again offered to drop the gift by, but Sarah wouldn't hear of it. For one thing, Katie had told Sarah that she was going to be induced the following day, and Sarah really didn't want her to have to worry about something as small as a baby gift. The two women actually chatted on the phone for over an hour. Sarah thought that this woman was just lonely and needed a friend. The next morning at 9 a.m., Katie arrived to pick up her second package. When Sarah arrived and headed down into the basement apartment, Katie actually locked the door behind her. Even though Sarah heard the door click, Katie insisted that she hadn't locked it, but that the door just stuck a lot. Once again, Katie said the receipt had been misplaced and insisted that Sarah wait while she went to look for it. Katie walked from room to room, looking for the receipt while Sarah followed. When Katie and Sarah went into the bedroom, the first thing Sarah noted was that she didn't really think a man lived in the bedroom. She didn't think it was really designed for a man to live in the bedroom. She also noticed a framed photo of the women from Sex in the City, just a picture cut out from a magazine that had been framed. But strangely, all the women's faces had been scratched out on the photo, and there were names written above the top of the women that, that Sarah couldn't read. Katie at one point questioned why Sarah was carrying around her keys in her hand. Sarah noticed a pack of cigarettes on the nightstand table, and next to it an inhaler with the name Katie Smith printed on it. That's the moment when Sarah's gut instinct kicked in and she knew something was really wrong. But before Sarah could listen to that instinct and leave the apartment, Katie threw herself onto the floor and began to scream that she had gone into labor. Sarah worked to help Katie into the bathroom and at one point while she was helping her in, they made eye contact. At that moment, Sarah knew. She said she could see the evil pouring out of Katie. At one point, Katie managed to turn so that Sarah was trapped in the bathroom. Sarah managed to distract Katie by asking her if she could check to see if her water broke and then slipped out behind her out of the bathroom. She was leaving. Sarah knew she had to get out of there, but she stopped for just a second to get her purse from the living room. And when she turned around, she saw Katie just standing there, perfectly calmly smoking a cigarette. Katie begged Sarah to stay until her husband arrived home. And Sarah said, nah. As Sarah walked to the door to leave, Katie asked if she could give her new friend a hug. Before Sarah could stop her, Katie grabbed her and started squeezing her tighter and tighter. Then 
Katie reached into the front pocket of her sweatshirt and pulled out a knife. This is when the struggle began. At one point, Sarah was able to knock the knife out of Katie's hand. The two women struggled with each other, pulling on each other's hair and, and beating on each other. In the struggle, Sarah lost her keys and her purse, but did manage to pull away from Katie and began to run towards the front door. She managed to get the front door unlocked and opened, but by the time she got to the screen door, Katie had already run towards her, pulling her back by her hair and her shirt. She dragged her back into the apartment and the fight continued. At one point, Katie began bashing Sarah in the back of the head with a large glass object, either a candy dish or an ashtray. At this moment, something in Sarah clicked. She grabbed the ashtray and started beating Sarah back in the back of the head until Sarah stopped moving. Sarah rushed to the door, but astonishingly, Katie got right back up. She told Sarah she wasn't going anywhere. Katie had managed to find the knife. She again attacked Sarah, stabbing her in the hand and shouting, I want that baby. The struggle, the fight continued until Sarah managed to wrestle the knife away from Katie and stabbed her into what she thought was her shoulder. She shoved Katie as hard as she could, who bounced off the love seat and hit her head on the wall. This gave Katie enough time to run out of the apartment and to try to find anyone that could help her. She shouted, I need help to the first woman she saw. That woman, despite seeing Sarah covered in blood, very obviously pregnant and in distress, just pointed to the top of the hill and said, there's a police station up there, and drove away. She started going up the hill as fast as she could to the police station when a woman drove by who also had her daughter in the car. The woman said that she would go home to call 911. By the time paramedics arrived, Sarah was in cardiac arrest. The paramedics worked to calm her and stabilize her heart as she shouted that a woman had tried to stab her and steal her baby. When police and emergency personnel arrived at the apartment, they found Katie, but also they found a padded pregnancy suit stained with blood. Inside a zippered pouch in the living room, they found gloves, gauze, and a homemade clamp used to clamp off an umbilical cord. They also found other women's addresses, phone numbers, and due dates written in crayon on a piece of paper, as well as Sarah's. It turns out these women were also listed on the Baby's RS registry webpage and lived nearby. Eventually, they found mail for Scott and Sarah that had probably come from inside their house, which was not only incredibly creepy, but was definite evidence of pre-planning for this crime. Katie Smith was pronounced dead soon after arriving at the hospital's emergency room. At first, Sarah actually became the focus of the investigation. Despite the fact that Sarah's injuries were very obviously defensive wounds, the pregnancy suit and other evidence found at the apartment, Katie's family actually brought a theory that Sarah had actually offered to sell Katie her baby for $5,000, but then changed her mind and also decided to just kill her instead. Sarah was initially questioned by police in the hospital, and then after her discharge at 4 p.m. on the same day, she went to the police station to continue to give her side of the story. It was during this course of time that the police really started to believe that Sarah wasn't at fault at all, and they really just needed a statement of her side of the events. A few days later, Katie Smith's family relayed their apologies to Sarah for what had happened through the police. Okay, let's talk about two major components of the pathology of Katie Smith. First, faking pregnancy. There are, I guess, many motives for people who choose to fake a pregnancy, but most often the motive for faking a pregnancy is to keep a partner. Katie didn't have a partner. This was not the first time that Katie faked a pregnancy and these were deep, pretty involved lies that included things like gravestones for her infant children. Those two things really make me believe that there's a deeper pathology to this. When a woman claims to be pregnant, even though she knows she is not, it has a special classification in the DSM-5, which is a manual used for the diagnoses and assessment of mental illnesses. 
It is known as factitious disorder imposed on the self, otherwise known as Munchausen syndrome. The exact cause isn't known, but one theory suggests that abuse or neglect in childhood can be a cause of this disorder. There are also potential connections between factitious disorders and personality disorders. I actually think Katie suffered from both of these. She most likely suffered from a histrionic personality disorder, which among other things would have caused Katie to constantly seek attention. Unfortunately, treatment of factitious disorder imposed on the self is usually challenging and there are no clearly effective treatments. Lying about pregnancy isn't that uncommon, but the heinous next step that Katie attempted to take is pretty unusual. For whatever reason, the lie got bigger than Katie could handle, or she just wanted a child that desperately that she was willing to commit an absolutely atrocious act in order to make that happen. This brutal and desperate crime she attempted has a name, fetal abduction. This happens when a woman desires a baby so badly that she's willing to murder the mother take the baby from the womb, and work to pass the baby off as her own. There have been 25 reported cases of fetal abduction in the United States since 1974. Like I said, it's pretty rare. Women who commit or attempt to commit this heinous crime tend to be controlling or manipulative and have a desperate need for attention. They also have a strong desire to control those around them. They are desperately seeking the cherished status of pregnancy and early motherhood to gain that control. Sounds a lot like Katie. Tim Smith, Katie Smith's father, had his conviction overturned in 2005. That was in part due to Katie Smith's actions towards Sarah Brady and her tendency to compulsively lie. Michaela Grace, Sarah and Scott's daughter was born by C-section, perfectly healthy, on February 16th, 2005, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Sarah, as you can imagine, does suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder due to the attack. She has made peace with her role in what happened. She and Scott are still together, raising Scott's son and their daughter. So what do you think? What could cause someone to pathologically lie about something that could so easily be disproven. Why do women lie about being pregnant? And why do you think Katie took this to this point of no return? Could treatment even have helped Katie? And what about Sarah? What do you think about her? Could you do what she did in order to protect her family? This is a tough one. I have a lot of empathy towards Katie, who grew up in squalor with parents who were unable to care for her in the way that she needed. I don't know if she was molested or not, but I think it's possible. And I think that trauma could have led to these actions that she took later in life. It's possible that trauma sparked a, a pathological need for attention that ended tragically. She had very loud and obvious cries for help that were ignored even in childhood. But at the end of the day, this was not psychosis. This was planned methodically to the point where it's possible that she actually went into Sarah's house before the crime. She had the tools to make the crime possible down to the things that she would need after a baby was born. She is the criminal in this. She is the perpetrator of the crime. Those demons really came out of her on that February day. Thanks for hanging out with me. If you have an idea for a crime, or more importantly, a margarita, feel free to join us on social media. The links are in the description box. Next week, we're headed to my hometown, Lawrence, Kansas, for some historical mayhem. I'll see you next week, and remember, there are always alternatives to murder. <laughs>